Today, in week 7, we're going to finish off our look at indexes. Our content files are not going to be content files at all, but a file of 46 MARC records downloaded from a library OPAC. So the first thing we want to do is run the GLI and create a new collection. We'll call it week 7, and it's going to be a subject-based catalog. All the records are on a similar subject. So I've downloaded the file of MARC records uh, into the Dropbox uh, under LIS 9720 week 7 uh, and it's called Weldon.Mark. Now there's a handout in the Dropbox that shows you how to do this um, from the Weldon catalog. Just, uh, there are a lot of OPACs around that you can uh, batch download MARC records. In fact, Greenstone itself can batch download records, so we're not going to do that. So we've got the records already there. Uh, it's all on the subject of databases, pretty well SQL or SQL database books that we're going to use for this. Um, what we're doing today shows you how you could create a subject catalog by getting various MARC records uh, on that subject. Now when you go to drag in the Weldon.Mark file from the Dropbox into the collection window, you'll get a pop-up. The pop-up says that there's no plugin uh, currently in use that knows how to use that particular type of file. The plugins are, work on the file extension, so our MARC record has an extension of .marc, but it does know that it has a plugin called MARC plugin and suggests that you use it. Now, certainly you should, so click Add Plugin. Now, because all 46 MARC records are in one file, we've got to extract them out. So we have to right click on the Weldon.Mark file in the collection window, and then from the menu, uh, select Explode Metadata Database. What this is going to do is extract out all the 46 separate records. Now in the Mark plugin for the Mark records, we want to put a tick mark in the metadata set box and then choose from the pull down which metadata set are they going to be mapped into. Um, Greenstone understands a number of metadata sets, and in fact it has a file for mapping MARC records into Dublin Core, either the basic one or the qualified one. There's no difference uh, in between those. There's no additional information added, so you might as well choose the Dublin Core metadata element set uh, 1, 1, the basic one. Now when it's finished extracting the MARC records from the file, you can go off to the Enrich tab and take a look. Uh, we can expand the Weldon folder and we see there's 46 files in there. Now I had to create these files. There's nothing actually in the file because Greenstone attaches metadata to a digital file. Without a digital file you can't attach metadata. So all the MARC record metadata gets attached to a null file, a file with nothing in it. And we could do the same thing with a plain TXT file that had nothing in it as well. But Greenstone creates these null files that are files really and attaches the metadata to them. Now that the MARC plugin has done its work to import the MARC file, we don't need it anymore. So we can go off to the Design tab, click on Document Plugins, select the MARC plugin, and then click Remove Plugin to get rid of it. Now this is a two-step process. The first step in the process was to use MARC plugin to extract the MARC records from the MARC file and attach them to a bunch of null files, each one null file for each MARC record. The second step in this process is to now take those null files and process them using the null plugin. So click on Design, Document Plugins, and then click uh, Configure Plugin. Now, if you're going to configure the null plugin, uh, what you want to do is add a tick mark to the Add Metadata as Text checkbox. What this does is uh, switch the full text search engine. Now the default for the full text search engine is to search the content of files. So if you're bringing in Word documents or PDF documents or HTML documents, all the words in those documents are indexed into the full text search engine. Now because we've got the null files, which have no content, they're absolutely blank, that won't work. You'll get um, this document has no text as the result of any searches. So by doing this checkbox, it switches the search engine to go after the metadata. So it will search the metadata as the full text search engine, which is very useful. The next step after gathering documents and uh, configuring your plugins to process them, because all plugins have options, is to decide what kind of indexes you want. 
Um, now browsing indexes are very, very useful. While a search index search function is handy, browsing ones solve some of the problems with search engines. The person doesn't have to know the spelling, they don't have to know what your control vocabulary is, uh, they can drill down from uh, general to specific things. Uh, they also get faceting information. They can see the frequency uh, or the number of uh, records under any index term so they could know which one is more important right off the start. So you wanted to create some indexes. The question is which indexes should you create and what kinds of indexes should you use? Before creating the new indexes, let's get rid of the useless ones. The ex source, which is the file names, must always be deleted. And a title index really doesn't return much more value over the full text search engine, so delete that as well. After deleting those two useless search indexes, then you want to delete the useless browse index, which is the ex source or file name index. So delete that one as well. Now you'll want to keep the default title indexes. All collections uh, usually have uh, an index by title, which is really a list of all the records in the collection. Now the default index type for that is the list index type, which is a straight alphabetical list of the titles. Uh, here's an example of one that starts with a guide uh, and goes down to accelerated advanced. So a very straight A to Z list of every record in your collection. Now, a title type index doesn't necessarily have to be based on title. For example, if you had an accession number or something like that, or some sort of a, um, unique identifier, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you could create an index based on that that lists all the records in the collection. But by default, it's a list of the titles. And if you have more than 20 uh, items in the index, it starts to break it up into partitions, which appear at the top of the index in a horizontal list. You see here A to L, M, P, P, R, P, R, I, Q. Uh, and that basically helps to prevent uh, excessive scrolling, up and down scrolling by the user. Now one problem with the list index type is, is the way it sorts things. It uses strict computer sorting, which doesn't follow AL filing rules. Um, computer sorting is different than what we think of as sorting. For example, if you took a number sequence of from 1 to uh, 12, uh, you may code it as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, but the computer will see the sequence different. It will take 1 through 9 in order, but the number 10 will actually come after 1. So it'll be 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. So 10, 1, 10, 11, 12. That's how the computer will collate things. So sometimes you don't want the same sorting or collating sequence uh, used. Particularly, for example, if you were taking a physical records collection. Physical, um, let's say, you know, vertical files or something, and changing it into a digital one where things are followed by ALL filing rules, all of a sudden now things are not going to be in the same place. Uh, in the computer, things will be under A or under T. So anything beginning the A something something or the George Wood Foundation will not be followed where you would normally would find them in a physical filing sequence. This can become a problem. A solution to the filing problem for that type of collection can be to change from the list index type to the AZ list index type. What that does is remove any prefixes from the metadata. So A and uh, all that sort of stuff is not counted as part of the sorting sequence. This will put things in a more ALA-like sort order uh, so that your physical files, when brought over to a digital collection, may end up in the same place. For example, let's say we decided to create a um, AZ list index for DC title. Uh, so we create that, build it, and take a look at it, and we'll see the difference between that and the straight list index type. So here are the two indexes side by side. The one on the left is the list one. You can see it starts with a guide, a guide, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the one on the right is now the AZ list index type. You notice the prefixes are not there, so the items are sorted in a more natural to humans kind of order. Now you don't need AZ list uh, for just about anything except for where you really want that ALA sorting order, and typically this is with physical files, so um, it's not used that much, but it's a handy index type to know about. It can also be useful in a collection where 
personal names are quite important, where you want records to be grouped by individuals. Uh, for example, if uh, this is a collection on Henry VIII, so maybe the wives of Henry VIII are quite important. So by uh, creating an AZ list, we could possibly collate everything together here. So we'd have all the Anne's records grouped together, which would be fairly useful. Now for a bibliographic type collection, um, other indexes that might be useful here are the author, date of publication, subject certainly, maybe language of the publication would be useful. Publisher might be handy. People want to know, um, is this a you know a good quality publisher or Joe's Garage? Uh, ISBN would be similar to the title one. It would be a list of all the records in ISBN order, right, with, by the number. And unfortunately, our MARC records will actually put the data into these fields automatically. So the MARC record format has been mapped to the Dublin Core, so these elements will get populated when we exploded the database. The other thing to note is that, except for ISBN, all of those index types are going to be using the AZ Compact List Index because they're all going to collate records into categories so we're going to have to use that index type this is this is quite common most of your indexes will be AZ compact list uh, it does make categories but the downside it makes the formatting more difficult because there are a number of greenstone variables you have to use plus you're going to have to use conditional formatting the other thing about the AZ compact list is that you have to be very careful to be consistent in your data entries. Otherwise, you're not going to get the records collated together. Here we notice the huge variation in the author's name. Not good. So make sure that the entry data is consistent. It is capitalized. It should not be lowercase. And then later, you're also going to probably want to replace the default bookshelf icon with something with a better affordance that indicates it can be clicked. Now, this indicates here uh, the different nodes uh, and different levels in the AZ Compact List Index. Now, we can see in the first column, uh, what we have here is the index node level. We're going to display the bookshelf icon. If we're at the record index level, we're going to display the icon for the type of document or source file. And the second column, again, at the index node level, we get the text of the node. In this case, it's the author's name. And in the record level, we're going to have the title of the document. So the code at the top is a fairly simple way of doing it, of um, mixing up the use of the word if to determine which level we're at, and using the same uh, variables uh, at the top for two different functions. This is why AZ compact lists are a little complicated, but you have to understand them because you're going to use them a lot. So let's create some indexes. Okay, the first one we're going to do is going to be, uh, I'm not sure which one it is, but go off to design, click browsing classifiers, select AZ compact list from the pull down, and then click add classifier. One decision you have to make uh, if you're configuring the, the properties for uh, any index is, do I only want one value, the first value? Or do I want to have all of the values? Uh, particularly, for example, in something here where there could be multiple authors to a book, maybe we want all the authors of the book. So if we do the all values checkbox, we're going to make sure that we get all of the values. You notice there's a checkbox for first value only if we only want a primary author. Uh, the other thing we usually want to change is the menu label. By default, the menu label is the same as the element name, in this case, creators. That is not necessarily a good menu label. It may confuse people. It will be more or less usual seeing something like author or authors. So we're going to change the menu label to authors in this case. Notice that it's all lowercase because um, one of the um, style default styles in Greenstone is to uh, lowercase all the menu labels. So there's no sense putting an uppercase here. Later on, we can change that through style. So, but right for now, we're just going to call it authors. Earlier, I said that one of the issues with AZ Compact List is you must have consistent data. If you don't have consistent data, the index will be a mess. So maybe we should check our data. Hey, these are marked records. Aren't they good? Well, if we take a look at the DC Creator things, we see a little bit of variation. We have people's names, last name first, that's good. We also have Springer Link in there and Net Library as authors. 
Well, I guess that makes sense. But we also have a little other uh, variations. We have some small variations of the dates and things. So they're not quite totally consistent. This will cause some issues, but hopefully not too many. Now, checking out the data before you create an index can help solve some problems or prevent some problems from occurring. Example is dates. Now, how good is the date data? We take a look at it, we see the date data is all over the map, totally inconsistent. We have copyright C for some of them, uh, one's in brackets, one has two years. Uh, the other ones all look fairly consistent. This is going to cause a real problem. One, the index entries aren't going to be collated correctly. Two, this is not a standard date format. So if we want to really use a date list index type, we can't. It'll crash our web server because uh, dates must be then in YYYY. MMDD. So we can't use a date list. We can use an AZ compact list and later on we're going to use a trick to try to fix up some of these things. But it's quite obvious that this data is a mess and an old computer saying is garbage in, garbage out. Okay, let's create the date index. So click on design, browsing classifiers, AZ compact list. We select that from the pull down menu and then click add classifier. So uh, go off to uh, Design Browsing Classifiers and use the AZ Compact List, pull down to add one, and set the metadata to DC date. So this will make an AZ Compact List, and we'll see what the result is. The next uh, index after date will be the subject one. So it's back to the Design Browsing Classifiers. Select AZ Compact List from the pull down and click Add Classifier. When you're selecting the metadata element uh, on which the index to be based, um, it's best not to type it in because you may make a mistake and then your index is not going to work. The pull down menu to the right will allow you to select whatever metadata element you want and it puts it in automatically. So that's a, a better practice. Oh, I said date earlier, but this is in fact the subject index we're building. So let's take a look at the um, data values in DC subject and keywords. When we look at them, they look all fairly good. These are probably Library of Congress subject headings. But you notice one thing about them, they're very flat in that there's no hierarchy to them. So we have things like uh, query languages, which is a broader term for SQL, which is a query language. Uh, under SQL, we could have a variation of SQL, SQL Plus and SQL Oracle. So we don't have that kind of hierarchical arrangement, uh, it's going to be a very long, very flat list. This is not great. We could fix this, but it requires editing the metadata to add the vertical pipe symbol between them. So we would have to design the index to be hierarchical. Because it's not hierarchical right now, we're going to use the AZ compact list instead of the hierarchy one. But this is not uh, optimal. So this is a, a very poor subject index. It's an incorrect, not incorrect, but it's, it's not a very good subject index. This will illustrate better what I mean. On the left here, we have a flat subject index or a flat type of index. Um, there's going to be just a bunch of headings and there's no indication of any relationship between them. For example, communities as disasters uh, related to the communities, it's separate. Uh, you could have, for example, communities, disasters, education underneath there and things like that, but there's no arrangement to it. The one on the right is hierarchical. So for example, if I come in, I first select my instrument from a list of instruments. Maybe I play the flute, the cello, or the guitar. Ah, so once I select guitar, then there's the various lays. What level am I at? Grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, I select the grade I'm interested in. And then under that, I can see, ah, repertoire. I drill, drill down, and I can see the actual records, okay? For guitar, here's a grade 1, the song list, here's the composer. And if I click on this, I then get the sheet music. So this is a very useful way for the user to quickly find the specific items they want. The one on the left, now we first we have to go to buildings and structures. Then we look at those records. We got to back up and then decide maybe we go to communities. We go down. It's a little bit more difficult. So a flat index is not as useful to your audience as a hierarchical one. Okay, there's our DC subject and keywords one. So let's add a new one. Uh, go off to design classifiers. Select AZ compact list from the pull down. Click add classifier.
Now we want to add a AZ compact list for publisher, so we're going to base the metadata on DC publisher. This should collate things by publisher. So if you see a good publisher, Rock Press or something, or O'Reilly, you could see all the books that they have. Collation, of course, to work implies consistency of data. So let's check the data. We can go in and look at the values for DC publisher, and oh my, oh my, look. They're all over the place. Addison Wesley, we've got three different variations there. Morgan Kaufman, uh, three different variations. We have also have a problem in that, uh, probably due to the multiple lines of the publisher, um, I didn't look at the original Mark records, but maybe the publisher's name and then their address is in there. So we have um, locations, Berkeley, California, in three different variations of spelling in there. So. Uh, there's not any consistent here. This is a huge mess. Oh, oh, there's another M. Kaufman. Four variations for Kaufman. So this is not going to work very well at all. Before we add our last index type, which is the ISBN, maybe we should check that data too. The cataloging, I must say, has not been great so far. I've not been impressed. Uh, at least here they're all in numeric order. Uh, they do have variations on the N, but that's okay. So they would be sorted correctly. So this would be a list index type for these ones. To make the ISBN index, we click on Design, Browsing Classifiers, um, we select List from the pull-down menu, and click Add Classifier. Now the first thing in the configure part is to indicate which metadata element. We use the pull-down because then we can select DC Redorse Identifier. Uh, it's difficult sometimes to know how to refer to things if you just type it in. Should I call it DC Resource Identifier? Can I say DC Identifier? So it's always best to use the pull-downs. Now what I'm also going to do is prevent the horizontal partitions from appearing at the top. So I'm going to tick the partition type checkbox and set that to none. So in this case there will be one large list. So however many ISBNs is as far as you're going to scroll. So it'll be quite a good by scrolling as the collection grows. I'm also going to sort it differently. I'm going to sort it not by the default DC title, but by the ISBN. So there'll be an ISBN order. Now we can build the collection and take a look at it. Anytime you're building a collection, you should always scan the build log that's being displayed. Uh, this is saved to a file, a log file, but it's also displayed on your screen. So always check that to see if there's any problems in some of your files. In this case, we see all 46 records were processed correctly. Okay, let's take a look at our indexes. Our title index is the uh, same as all of them. And you notice it has at the top the horizontal list that creates partitions based on groupings. You can control how the groupings, how many are done uh, in the um, configuration for any plugin uh, or index. Um, here we have A to F, I to O, P to T. Now that's for the titles. You notice the ISBN is also a list index type, but it doesn't have any because we turn that off by using the partition type within and we set it to none. If we take a look at our date index, we see the mess created by some dates having a C before them and some dates not. None of them are correlated properly. Now there is a bit of a fix for that. Uh, prefixes and suffixes can be removed. If we go back to uh, our design tab and reselect AZ compact list and browsing classifiers and then configure it again, you notice there's some options here. So. We're going to put a tick mark in remove prefix. We're going to uh, remove that C from all of the dates that have the copyright uh, C character before it. We're also going to change the nesting a little bit. So what we're going to do is set that to a large value. What this will do will prevent the partitions from forming at the top. Now if we do this and then rebuild, we can uh, see the difference in the two collections. So on the left is the original one. We see that things were not collated particularly well. Uh, we've fixed that on the second one because by removing the C, we've got all the records, for example, that were under C1992 or now in the 1992 one. However, we still have some problems. Uh, the record with the brackets, uh, we could have removed. The trouble is we can only set one prefix to use, so we couldn't get rid of the bracket one. So we have one poor entry. Again, uh, if your data is inconsistent or bad, your indexes will be bad. So you have to fix the data first. Here's the result of our data fixing. We see the index, as I said, is almost perfect, except for the bracket one. 
right? So in the 1992, everything's collated except for the records underneath the bracket, 1992 bracket. So a bit better, but still, the only solution is to edit the metadata. Let's go take a look at our publisher's index. How did that work out? Well, as we predicted from the data, not very well. We've got three entries for Addison Wesley, so none of those are collated. We've got three Berkeleys, nothing's collated there. We've got four uh, Morgan Kaufmans, nothing's collated there. Index is a mess because the data was a mess. Now, because our publisher's index has more than 20 records, by default, it gets broken into uh, partitions. Now, we can turn that off. We turned it off for the ISBN uh, and our other one and our date one. Or we can use that to format it. It's an H list. Remember we've been formatting so far vertical list, V list? Well, you can also do some formatting of an H list that may be useful. Let's take a look at how that technique can be done. If we select format, format features, and then choose H list, we can see what the default format of these horizontal lists are. Basically, there's a link, so the uh, partition uh, text is hyperlinked to the records under that partition, so they're collated. So it sort of operates like a bookshelf icon. When you click on the, it shows you all those records. Uh, it's put in bold using the highlight tags. Um, the actual text of the partition is held in EX title again, so now that's used for something else. So we've got a EX title holds the text and it's bolded and hyperlinked. So we need to keep the EX title in the link, but we can also add a little maybe style information to change what that looks like. So if we replace the HTML code, uh, what we have here is links. So we're still going to be hyperlinked. We've still got EX title, but I've added a span tag because it's a single line. And I've added some inline CSS. I've changed the color. I've made the font bigger. I've added a bit of white space around it, some margins. And I've changed the spacing of the letters a little bit just to uh, make it a little bigger, different color to stick out. So it's obvious that this is an index partition that you can click. Let's see. So what that code does is for any index that has partitions, remember we turned it off for two, but others do, titles and some others have the partitions, uh, authors and whatever, uh, you're now going to have bigger letters, uh, a little bit more spaced out with the white space around them. So we can see there. So it's a uh, probably a slightly nicer uh, effect than what we have with the default formatting. Now here's a very clever use of the H list. So you notice rather than having the default uh, partition letters, they've created their own so that the uh, index um, um, entries or nodes are at the top. So if you click on community theaters, you see a list of uh, plays here that are uh, uh, useful for community theaters. So this is a very neat uh, technique. Now, how did she do this? Now she's done two things here that are interesting. One, well she's created her own metadata set for one thing. Second, she's stored a bunch of stuff in metadata elements that she's going to use. You notice DCS venue type stores the venue, so professional theater is stored in there. And then she's created her uh, indexes, all to be hierarchy type ones, and she's put the H list at top. Um, she selected that option, turned that on, and she's using the H list, which is going to be DSC venue type. So she's going to select that. So what she's also done is decide how she wants to sort them. Realizing that the computer will sort not the way you want, she's created her own sort order and stored that in a DC element. She's called it DCS cast cast sort. You know, she's put a number in that. Now she's used the number five instead of zero five, which means she's limited to sorting um, nine items. Uh, computer people, if you ever wonder why they use 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, it's because that will ensure that when you get to 11 and 12, they're in the proper sort order. If you don't, you'll get um, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So, but she's got her sort order in a metadata element. She's got the um, H list values in a metadata element. And so this is going to make for that nice index we saw earlier. And here's how she created the index. You know, she's got the metadata set to the venue type, and then she set the sort order to uh, DCS cast cast sort so that the records will be sorted in the proper order. 
what that last example shows you is that once you master the techniques, you can apply those in ways that no one's thought of before. You can come up with very innovative and clever solutions to problems. So rather than me telling you what you should do, what I look for is that you can apply known techniques in ways that haven't been done before. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, there's also other index types that you may find useful but are fairly rare. We saw the AZ list can be used for uh, collections that are based on paper ones. Um, textual studies are a different case in point. Textual studies tend to be a little different. The records tend to be longer. Uh, you're looking at certain kinds of things that are not typical. One type of index commonly used in textual studies of the past was a quick or keyword and context index. Greenstone has one of these. It does require a Java applet, so it requires Java enabled in the web browser, which is not great these days, but it does provide a very useful display for individuals. Now the quick index in Java or in Greenstone being based on Java is not great for security reasons and it's also a fairly ugly looking type of index. So how could you achieve the same thing without using that? Well, student one time decided they wanted a uh, first line index. So they're doing a poetry collection They decided the first line would be important. And how to do that? What they did was copy the first line of each poem and put it into a DC element. So they stored that in the database and then they created an index based on that. And so they could display a first line index. So then someone could go through, see the line of a poem, uh, click on that and get the actual poem. And here's that same first line techniques applied to a history collection. So we see we've got actually the first line of the record displayed and then an icon that when click would take you to the entire record. We also have the code that they use for this. What they've done is uh, made it larger so it's easier to see the first line. They've added some padding around it um, and transformed it all into uppercase uh, and made it larger. So it's quite clear that this is a big first line that you can just scroll through. So that shows you most of the index types in Greenstone. There's other ones we haven't covered because they're rarely used, but again, you can investigate them. Uh, the other thing you're going to be doing in upcoming weeks is formatting them. We didn't do any much formatting with these indexes. All the indexes have default formats, which we're going to change. They also have default icons. Here's a list of them all, which are rather old. They look more, uh, they're two-dimensional. They lack affordance. They're not particularly attractive or useful. So we're going to have to replace all the icons as well which means in the next coming week we're going to start talking about style.